how's everybody doing? Nice to see you, man. I'm tired, man. I'm recovering. What's up, Falarmo? What's up, baby? Okay, guys. I put the rules there. I posted it for every one of you. Now, Full Armor, I hope you appreciate this, right? Okay. So, guys, everyone there, let me just get ready. You don't bring me flowers. You don't sing me love songs. Pray the Lord blesses the internet connection, the audio visual qualities. They're optimal. What's up? Is Prada's believer here? Is it always per, per, protesting? How's everybody doing? Yeah. You don't bring me flower. You don't sing me love song. By the way, just to let you know, you know the rules here, right? Respect the rules so I respect you so I don't cuss you out. Let's try it again. You know the rules, right? Number one, there is no pontificating. What's up, Thomas? What's up, baby? No pontificating. Number two. There is no condemning us, thinking you're better than us, you're more spiritual than us, and that you're holier than us because we don't care for your opinion. We think you're trash, you're scum, you're filth. Number three, you're not going to help me by posting verses. And number four, you're not going to ask irrelevant questions. This is a class. We want the Holy Spirit to be the teacher. And may use my mouthpiece and grant me perfect recall of every jot, total poor scripture, destroy all errors and sin. And help us to hate all errors and sin and love truth and obey truth for the glory of the Father and the Spirit. Yes, so there you go. All right. What's on my forehead is the mark. There's a mark on my forehead. Okay. Just by the way, is proof. Okay, here, let me show you. This tells you, glory to the Father, glory to the Son, Lord Jesus Christ, glory to the Holy Spirit. I still wear large. I wear large. My T-shirts are large. I still fit in large. Now, I need you to pray for me. Ask the Lord in his mercy to give me miraculous, supernatural, strict discipline, spiritually, physically, to stay tight, eating healthier, exercising, and getting holier, so I never outgrow large, and large will be loose on me. But these two days, I'm recovering from a food coma because I had the greatest pizza in the world with Kit Kats and you name it. So I'm getting back slowly. I ask God in his mercy to give me discipline. Start doing my intense cardio, <clears throat> hiking, <clears throat> walking, and eating tight. But this is it, large. So you guys don't know, lie, large. And they still loose on me. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Pray my head shrinks. It looks as lean as it did before. But now, if you're wondering what this is, it's the mark. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Anna. I don't know what Chinese large means. Chinese large means that's a small, but I hope so. Buddy, I grew up on Chicago deep dish, mister. Okay, so this right here is the mark. But the question is, what mark? What well, question is, what mark is it? Some of these shirts are tight on the top, so it may be, right? Is it the mark of the beast? Is it a mark that signifies I'm sealed for day of redemption? Is it the mark of Sunday worship according to seven-day Adventist? Last night was super intense for me. You got it, Lepanto, you gorgeous beast, you. Last night was super intense. As you can tell, last night, at one point, we had 4,000 people. <clears throat> and you can see I was very angry and animated. Why? Because it wasn't easy to see this man who's not a fighter, who hasn't been in street fights, who hasn't done martial arts, from my knowledge, get attacked this way. Those of you who have been in street fights, those of you who have done martial arts, have been around martial arts, would know how to respond to someone attacking you with a knife. Because the way the man attacked, he was a young punk who didn't know how to use a knife. Glory to the Father, Holy Spirit. But you guys who've been in the streets and fought in the streets or 
in martial arts gyms, you know the reaction of someone who's got some street savvy, some street savvy. You can tell this man doesn't have any mm -hmm. street savvy. He's not a fighter. He's a servant of Jesus Christ. To then see that happen angered me and enraged me. Angered me and enraged me. I got to close the window. Hold on. Let me see something. See that? Look at it. Hey, Snoopy, Snoopy, hang on. Pray. So I was very agitated and angry, and it didn't help. It didn't help the situation when you had people trying to use this as an opportunity to bash him because supposedly he's an historian and he's a heretic. This is why I was animated. Look at that. Look at that, man. Right? So this is why I was very animated. And I treated people the way I did. But I hope those of you who watched it, those of you who watched it, you learned on a very high in-depth level by the mercy and power of the Holy Spirit that Jesus was not a pacifist. Jesus was not a wimp. Jesus was not a hippie. Jesus was a stern warrior that our Lord himself used physical force and exertion and was not politically correct and would insult, ridicule people, and he actually used physical force against people. And you learn from Scripture that the Lord has authorized us from the Scriptures to bear arms and defend ourselves. Stay away from pacifists. Stay away from Bible butchers who think they know the Bible, think they know Scripture, and think that the Christian faith teaches to be a pacifist. It is a lie from the pit of hell. Now, someone asked me another question. Someone asked me another question. Well, what about the church for the first 300 years and the way they responded until Augustine? See, it again tells me people don't think with any great depth. Let me ask you guys a question as we're about to begin. How you doing, Crystals? Let me ask you a question as we're about to begin. I want to see if this will help me with my eyebrows. Okay. Do you expect Christians who are under Roman rule, under Roman rule, living under pagan oppression for 300 years, to be able to bear arms and defend their lands, their properties, and their lives? Does that make sense? Until Constantine made Christianity legal and Theodosius made Christianity the official religion, the Christians were living in caves, running for their lives, were being fed to the lions, crucified, burned alive, and killed. What kind of question is this? What kind of question is this, dude? They didn't have the choice to defend themselves. But... Coming back, amen, brother, God bless you. Amen, the cross of Jesus. Now, coming back to the point, do you know, can I share with you a fact about the early Christians? You can confirm it right now. I need you to listen. You know the rules. Help me to help you. Please respect the rules so I can respect you. Here's what I want you to do right now. No, nothing came out yet. Hold on. Let me see. What about my nose? Here's what I want you to do right now. Okay. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to go to Sheikh Google, the greatest scholar the world has ever known. Hold on, let's see. Oh, another way. Okay. Sheikh Google, the greatest scholar the world has ever known. Do me a favor right now. Okay, guys? I want you to go to Sheikh Google. I want you to, Ortho Chris, what's up, brother? I missed you last night. I want you to do me a favor. By the way, Ortho Chris, see, that tells you my shirts are still large. May I stay? Large and ever I grow large and it's loose on me in Jesus' name. Okay, please do me a favor. I want you to go to Sheikh Google right now. Type in 318 bishops at Nicaea, and type in 302 bishops. Did you know that that the 318 bishops that showed up for Nicaea, 302 of them had physical injuries, had physical scars. Some had eyes plucked out because during the Aryan controversy, the Christian bishops and priests and Christians were coming to physical blows 
and beating each other up and maiming each other in the streets? Did you know that? Can you guys confirm that? If Jerby is here, someone, do Sheikh Google. 302 out of the 318 bishops all had physical injuries because they came to blows, physically beating and maiming one another over the deity of Christ. Okay? Check it out. Yeah. They were not the, the kind of Christianity. Jesus loves you, brother. Jesus loves you. This I know. Check it out. And you guys know about Santa Claus. You guys know about Santa Oh, you mean the Christians were physically violent? Did you know about Santa Claus? Santa Claus was at the Council of Nicaea. Santa Claus was at the Council of like Nicaea. Santa Claus is based upon St. Nicholas. St. Nicholas. St. Nicholas was a Trinitarian. And he was there at the council. And tradition says that he jacked Arius. He smacked. Some even say he punched Arius in the mouth because he couldn't handle his blasphemy. So Santa Claus was being naughty and he wasn't very nice. <laughs> My kind of Santa. Santa baby. Santa baby. A Santa baby. What's up, man? What's up, bro? What's up? What's up? Santa baby. Yep, I'm gonna find it for you right now. We're gonna begin. What's up, man? What's up, baby? What's up? Come on, man. Come on, dude. Where is this, man? Come on, man. Come on. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Well, I'm a can. Someone said, "Did he just throw up the satanic horns?" <sighs> you don't bring me flowers. All right, now let's see. Let's see. 318. I'm going to show you Santa Claus. So, Nicholas, go away from my window. Leave at your own chosen speed. I'm not the one you won't wave. I'm not the one you need. But it ain't me, babe. Oh, no, no. Okay. St. Nicholas. Let's see what we find. Arius. <laughs> I found one. Away from my will. <laughs> Saint Nicholas loses his cool. Let's see. See, just check Google. They're greatest scholar of lit. See? Okay. Let's see. Ba -ba -na -na. La 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 la. I go away from my window. Let's read it. Saint Nicholas, Santa baby, ba -da 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 -da. go away from my. Let me enlarge it a little more. He was very naughty, Santa. It's naughty, naughty. You better not shout. You better not pout. You better not. How's it go? Man, I even forgot it. I'm telling you why. Santa Claus is coming to town and he'll jack you across your lip. In AD 325. Can you see it? Is it large enough? Is the screen large enough? You can see it, right? Do I lean large? You're okay. Sixies, uh, your mother is all about prostitution, not about purity. So why are you a whore and prostitute like your mother? Anyway. The one got it, right? Okay, that's large enough. All right. In three, in AD 325, Constantine convened the Council of Nicaea, the very first ecumenical council. More than 300 bishops came from all over the Christian world to debate the nature of the Holy Trinity. It was one of the early church's most intense theological questions. Arius from Egypt was teaching that Jesus' son was not equal to God the Father. <clears throat> Arius forcefully argued his position at length. The bishops listened respectfully. As Arius Lee vigorously continued, Nicholas, Santa Claus, Santa baby, became more and more agitated. 
Finally, he could no longer bear what he believed was essential being attacked. The outraged Nicholas got up, crossed the room, and slapped Arius across the face. Yeah, my kind of Santa, baby. <laughs> That's right, Santa. You weren't always nice. You were very naughty, naughty. You were so naughty, Santa. Naughty, naughty. La, 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 la. Naughty, naughty. So what happened to Santa Claus? Now, who vindicates him? Guess who comes to vindicate him? The Lord Jesus and the Theotokos appeared to him in a dream. All right, focus, Xenia. Here, the bishops were shocked. It was unbelievable that a bishop would lose his control. <laughs> you haven't seen anything yet. I dare you to make me a bishop. I won't eat the flock, but I'll beat the flock into repentance. Can you imagine me, your bishop? I'll show you what I do to you. Hold on. And be so hot in such a solemn assembly. They brought Nicholas to Constantine. Constantine said, <laughs> even though it was illegal for anyone to strike another in his presence, in this case, the bishops themselves must determine the punishment. The bishops stripped Nicholas of his bishop's garments, chained him, and threw him into jail. Poor dude. I know how you feel, brother. Even your own, your own spiritual homies sell you out. Been there, done that, bro. Been there, done that, homie. That would keep Nicholas away from the meeting. When the council ended, a final decision would be made about his future. Nicholas was ashamed and prayed for forgiveness, though he did not waver in his belief. During the night, Jesus and Mary's mother appeared, asking, why are you in jail? Because of my love for you. Did you hear it? Because of my love for you. Because I love you and adore you, and I cannot stand when people insult you, my Lord, or even degrade your blessed mother. So Jesus then gave the book of the Gospels to Nicholas. Mary gave him an omophorian liturgical vestment marked with crosses worn over the neck and shoulders by bishops in the Eastern Church, also known as pallium. So Nicholas would again be dressed as a bishop. So the Lord restored him. You compromised bishops. Now at peace, Nicholas studied the scripture for the rest of the night. When the jailer came in the morning, he found the chains loose on the floor. <clears throat> and Nicholas dressed in bishop's robes, quietly reading the scriptures. When Constantine was told of this, the emperor asked that Nicholas be freed. Nicholas was then fully reinstated as the bishop of Myra. The council of Nicaea agreed with Nicholas's views, deciding the question against Arius. The work of the council produced the Nicene Creed, which to this day many Christians, Christians repeat weekly when they stand to say what they believe. So here. Other versions of the story have Jesus and Mary with Nicholas appearing in a dream to Constantine or even to all the bishops. I believe all of that happened. In the dream, they gave the book of the Gospels and an omophorian to Nicholas, convincing Constantine the bishops that Nicholas should be reinstated as Bishop of Myra. <clears throat> Nicholas is one of the attendings at the Council of Nicaea, as listed by Theodore the Lector. So Theodore the Lector, his list in Historia, Tripartita, dated around AD 515, is regarded as the most important authentic source for determining those present at the council. This legend is over 500 years. All right, you get it. So you got it? There's no reason why this tradition should be false. So there you go. St. Nicholas, a man after my heart. Now, can you imagine if I was the bishop? This would be me. Bishop. Yep, Abraham 3-2. Yeah, exactly. Bishop, if I was the bishop, I'd say, hey, Jerby, it's been a while, son. You haven't come to confession, Jerby. What have you been doing? Hey, Padre, sorry, I've been busy. Oh, you have, huh? Padre, don't play that. Get to confession now, bastard. Hey, Sarah. I don't see you wearing a veil on your head, Sarah. Oh, and you came wearing tight pants, Sarah? Yeah. Get out of here. Get out of here. I don't want to see you in communion for three weeks. That's right. This kind of man I'd be. I wouldn't eat the flock. I'd beat the flock. Logo.
say oh sorry now we can get into the topic all right we can get we can get into the topic ready now we're going to finish the trinity and we're going to finish the trinity in genesis just pray for me i'm recovering it's been like two days driving and eating and i'm still like under the weather that's right yes yes hey hey lepanto how you been oh no you've been a good guy okay you know, it doesn't help that you know how to fight, too. You know, okay, but Ponto, don't worry about it. I absolve you. Get out of here. Imagine I'm in the confession booth and some says, Forgive me, Father, for I've sinned. Yeah, what is it this time? I did. Didn't you do that last week? Didn't you not tell me last week that's what you did? And then I absolved you and you said you ain't going to do it. Get out of here. One more time. One more time for the people. Get out of here, man. Get out of here. Okay. Get out of here. We're about to pray. We're going to pray. We're going to begin. Okay. Get out of here. Yeah. Get out of here. All right. Call me on Samuel again. Watch how I'm going to beat the snot out of you. All right. Peanuts, man. Peanuts. <laughs> Here it is proof that I still fit them hard. Thank you, Lord. Man, I never outgrow large. Here it is, you haters. Here it is, okay? Let's begin. Let's begin the Lord's Prayer. <clears throat> we got a lot to unpack. Hopefully, I can do it. Yeah, it says, Kafur, <clears throat> Masihi. Logos. Large and in charge. That's right. That's right. Name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, <clears throat> who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, crucified, died and was buried, descended to hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended to heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church. The communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of body, life everlasting. Amen. We ask, Holy Spirit, you give us perfect faith in the creeds because these are facts of history that have happened and shall happen and destroy our fears, doubts, unbelief. And give us the greatest gifts in your sight perfect faith in our God, hope in our God, perfect love for our God, and love one another by our deeds. <clears throat> our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, both now and forever, unto ages of ages. In the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Glory to the Father. Glory to the Son. Glory to the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' almighty name. Glory to the Father. Glory to the Son. Glory to the Holy Spirit, the one true God. His will be done. Glory to you, O Lord. Glory to you, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Glory to you, O Lord. Glory to you, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Glory to you, O Lord. Glory to you, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Now, I have to also begin finishing my series on the Lord's Prayer. I believe the Lord reminded me yesterday. I heard a sermon by a Protestant on the Lord's Prayer, and it put a fire in my heart to finish what I started. Pray in the name of our Lord. That by this upcoming week, I'll finish my response to Jamila White on atonement. I begin a series, Destroying Daniel Pikachu, and then go back and revisit the Lord's Prayer, trusting the Spirit to give us illumination, wisdom, to plunge the depth of Scripture, feast on the meat of Scripture, to be blown away how miraculous, how supernatural the Bible is. It is miraculous. It's historically accurate. And the wisdom there is wisdom that's not from this world. It is wisdom that can only come from God because it is the voice of God. 
And may the Spirit enable us to plunge that wisdom, then live it out and obey it and love that wisdom to be doers of the word. So I want to start doing all these series and finish them. But you see things come up. I thought I was already going to be done with Jamila White. And I thought also I would be starting my response to Jamila White. Now, guys, I want you to do me a favor. I'm being patient and I'm waiting. We're going to now begin. We ask the Holy Spirit to give me perfect recall of every jot, total portion of Scripture. Save me from error and stammering and my lisp. <clears throat> Help me to exegete Scriptures perfectly. Illuminate us to stay focused and then live out the Scriptures with perfect obedience and obey the Scriptures as proof of our love for our God, the Father, the Son, Lord Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Destroy distractions of Satan. Crucify our flesh to die to our flesh and walk in your life, Holy Spirit, and rebuke the enemy, Lord, Father, and Spirit. But here's what I want you to do for me in the meantime. There was a fly here. I got to find this thing. Whenever you need the spray to kill a fly, you can't find it. But here's what I need you to do for me in the meantime. I'm waiting patiently to see. I'm waiting patiently. Will that slob, Jamila Muhammad White, may the Lord help me not to be the thing I hate, destroy the beams in our eyes, hypocrisy from us, and may the Lord not hand me over to be the thing I hate in Jesus' name. May have mercy on us. Will Jamila Muhammad White, that slob, or Antonia Dodgers, that fat, oversized cow, may the Lord help me not to be the thing I hate and save me from the judgment that falls these false teachers. Will they mention Marmari? Can you do me a favor? Check their Twitter account. Check their YouTube channel. See if they say a word. I want to see what kind of low lives these Calvinists are, these satanic dogs of Calvin, these tools of Satan, these Bible butchers. May the Lord rebuke them and chasten them and empower us and seal us to destroy Calvinism for the glory of Christ and not to be like that. Will they say a word? Will they mention at least that this Christian man who's done more for the glory of Christ than they have was stabbed? I say that. Because when Hatun Tash, <clears throat> Hatun Tash got stabbed, James White did not do a dividing line. James White simply reposted someone's Twitter on it and didn't say a word because he's a lowlife. He's a lowlife. So do me a favor. Check and see if they say. I'll give them about a week. But you're going to see what kind of nasty, vile lowlives they are. They're worse than Mohammedans. In fact, that fat cow, Antonia, was with Matt Slick saying that a Muslim came up to him saying, it's okay, brother. He goes, because of my beard, the Muslim thought I was a Muslim. No, actually, I was a sign. Your God is no different than a Muslim God because you don't have the true God. The God of Scripture is not the God of Calvinism. You're a filthy bastard seed of Luther and Calvin, and your God is not the God of Scripture. That's why the Muslim thought you're a Muslim. All right? But anyway. I want you to do that for me so we can see. I want you to do that for me. Now, I need you to focus. You know the rules. Let's get into the topic. Let me show you the articles that we're going to be using for this session. So we're going to go into Genesis and, and the Trinity in Genesis, as the Spirit enables me. Genesis and the Trinity in Genesis. Have you heard about the hoopla about... O.J. Simpson, having passed away a few days ago, was he, what, 76 years old? And people have been talking about it. I wonder if he confessed, if he's the one who committed those murders, or did he keep that sin to his grave because he will face the Lord in the afterlife? But anyway, that's between him and his Lord. Okay, so now if you go here, you go here, and you see this handsome, oversized melon, you go to the description box right here. We're going to be using these articles right here. We're going to be using these articles right here in the description box. Go away from my window. Leave at your own chosen speed. So I'm going to show you the Trinity. Now, I'll be quoting Jewish sources, and I need you to listen to me. Make sure you represent what I say accurately, and you then pass it on accurately. I'm going to show you from Jewish sources, sources written by Jews who are not Christians, where they acknowledge the triunity of God, even though that's not their intention. 
No, this is not live. I recorded this 10 years ago, but because I'm a visionary and a prophet and I see the future, I was shown the comments 10 years ago to respond in advance. So behold the sun. 10 years later, when you see this, know that we're not live. I'm simply answering what I saw in a vision of you asking if we're live. So just rest assured, my son, we're not live, but I see your comments and I want to assure you, you are not being ignored. Heaven recognizes you. So now that I've answered your question, zip the lip, shut up and pay attention and don't ask stupid questions again. Okay, so there you go. Now, anyway, for the rest of you listening, yeah, Martin Luther is the son of Satan. And if you're his whore, then you're a daughter of Satan. And Jean Lucifer Calvin is his twin brother because they are Satan's sons. All right, now, for the rest of you, help me help you. Stay focused before I start insulting people. So what I want you to do is remember what I'm not saying. I am not saying... I am not saying these Jews were consciously affirming the Trinity. Okay, listen to me. You got to learn. I am not saying these Jews were consciously affirming the Trinity. They are not Christians. They don't believe in Jesus. They don't accept the New Testament. What I'm saying is these Jews recognized, realized from their reading of the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures, that God is depicted as being multipersonal. So they realized, <clears throat> realized that the God of Israel is not a single person. The God of Israel is not a single person. They realized the God of Israel is multipersonal. So they were aware of the word of God, distinct from God who happens to be God. They're aware of the Holy Spirit, distinct from God, inseparable from God, and he can speak. They're aware that this angel is the second power in heaven. Now. Though they were aware of these facts, they did not systematize what they could see from the Hebrew Scriptures, and they did not come up with a coherent doctrine to explain the facts of the Hebrew Bible. Are you listening? Do you understand what I'm saying and what I'm not saying? Help me to help you. Please stay focused. Don't chime in. Just answer me. This is a class. I want the Spirit to work through me, so answer me. You understand what I'm not saying, right? I'm not saying they were affirming the Trinity, were conscious of the Trinity. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying they knew from the Old Testament. They didn't read the New Testament. They didn't believe in Jesus. They didn't accept Christianity. But they could see from the Old Testament more than one divine person. They knew Yahweh Most High, whom they called their father. But then they could see that this angel is another divine power. But then they also realize God's word, which in Aramaic, as one person noted, is called Mamra in Hebrew, Devar, is a distinct person <clears throat> whom God sends, who speaks as God and acts as God. And they realize the Holy Spirit is inseparable from God, but distinct from God as well. All of these facts, they gather from the Old Testament. They saw these facts in their Old Testament. But they did not systematize these facts and come up with a coherent doctrine. That was left up to the church of Jesus Christ. Okay, you with me there? Understand what I'm saying, what I'm not saying? So when I show you what they say about Genesis chapter 1, Genesis chapter 2, Genesis chapter 3, or about Genesis as a whole or the Old Testament, you'll be shocked. You're going to think these are Christians writing these statements. Now, I've done many sessions on these topics over the previous years, and I have many articles, as you can see. Here's one. You owe it to yourself to rewatch those sessions or watch them for the first time until the material becomes second nature, and then you use the material to magnify the triune God and show how the Old Testament and the New Testament perfectly agree with one another over against Judaism and Islam. Exactly, Ortho Christos. So I'm going to show you from the Old Testament, the Trinity, in Genesis, but then I'm going to show you what the Jewish sources indicate. Okay, so let me show you the other article. So if you go back here, you go here again, down here. You go to 
here, description box, the second article. The Trinity in Targum Neofiti. Neofiti. Let me show it to you. So we're going to line them up and get ready. The Trinity in Targum Neofiti. Neofiti. Now, let me explain the term Targum. Targum is an Aramaic word. My mother tongue is Syriac. It's from Aramaic. Assyrians, Chaldeans, Surioyo, we all are ancient people. We all speak Aramaic. We speak modern Aramaic, what we'd call Syriac, and there are various dialects of Syriac. So the word Targum is Aramaic. Targum means to interpret, to explain, right? Not just to translate. Like I will say to someone, Targum. Terja means to interpret, to explain. It can mean also to translate. So right away, the word Targum is an Aramaic word. And these are Aramaic paraphrases. Paraphrases of the Old Testament written by Jews in Aramaic. Now, can I give you a little history? Even though I've mentioned this prior, but preach repetition, we need to hear something repetitively until it becomes second nature. Guys, pay attention. Focus on me, answer my question, let the Spirit work through me to bless you. Okay, let me explain to you the history of the Jews. During the Babylonian captivity, the Jews who were taken into captivity, the Jews, buddy, I'm on a live stream, Yusuf. You ever sin again and call me during live, you're going to get hurt, mister. Go watch me. Take care, sir. All right, anyway. The Jews who were taken into captivity were not able to read or write Hebrew because the lingua franca, the language that was spoken the world over, was Aramaic. So for the benefit of those Jews who couldn't read or write Hebrew, they decided to paraphrase the Old Testament into Aramaic. But then Alexander of Macedonia came along. Alexander of Macedonia came along and he Hellenized the world and the lingua franca, the language that was spoken by the people, was Greek. And so the Jews who lived in exile, who did not return to Israel and its environs, but lived among the Gentiles, many of those Jews not only could not read or write Hebrew, they could not read or write Aramaic, they could only read and write Greek. So then Jews translated the Old Testament into Greek for the benefit of those Jews called Hellenized Jews, Grecian Jews. And that Greek translation became the official translation of the Old Testament for Greek-speaking Christians. And it's the official Old Testament for the Greek Orthodox Church. It's called the Septuagint. The Septuagint. Septuaginta. The tradition says about 71 rabbis translated the first five books of Moses 280 years before the birth of our Lord, starting what's known as the translation of the 70. Are you with me there? See, Joel, if you're patient, I would have gotten to that point. So what you're going to find in the history of the Jews, Aramaic translations of the Old Testament. Greek translations of the Old Testament. So the Aramaic Targums, the word Targum is an Aramaic word. Targum means to explain, to interpret, to translate. The Targumim, Targumim is plural, meaning the translations, the explanations, the interpretations of the Old Testament done by Jews, and it started before the time of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. One second. No, you don't see. That's why you got to get out of here. Get the oldest son out of here, please. I don't want him here. Okay, you with me there? No, Sister K. This is Alexander is Alexander Coppersmith, the one that opposed Paul and Paul condemned. 
and prayed God's wrath on him. It's been a long time I haven't spoken to my friend Butch. I just said, Alexander of Macedonia, who conquered the world, Alexander the Great, Skander Jadid. And she's asked me, yes, is it the same Alexander as Alexander the Great? Timmy, it's been a long time I haven't talked to you guys. I know I've been very busy, Timmy. I'm sorry, Timmy and Jimmy and Timmy and I wasn't calling you Jimmy. Jimmy is the couch. You're Dino and that's Bruno. Timmy, Dino, Bruno, Jimmy and Butch. It's been a long time. But Timmy, can I ask you or should I ask Butch this question? Alexander of Macedonia who conquered the world, Hellenized the world. Who else could that be but Alexander the Great? But maybe it was Alexander Coppersmith. So, yes, it's Alexander the Great. According to Islamic tradition, who was Dhul Qarnain, the two-horned one, and he was a Muslim who submitted to Allah, and he found where the sun sets, and he found that the sun sets in a hot spring, a muddy spring, according to chapter 18, verses 83 to 98 of the Quran. That's the story. Okay, we got it now? Okay, one. It's okay? So we got it now, okay, May? Yeah, the, yeah, yeah. He probably was Alexander Copperfield because, you know, he's a magician, so he can go back in time. All right, now everyone got it? Okay, we got it now? Okay, did you understand why the Jews translated the Old Testament into Greek and Aramaic? Because the Jews who were scattered, called the Diaspora Jews, could no longer read or write Hebrew, and someone could not read or write Aramaic. So those who could only read and write Greek, they produced a Greek translation of the Old Testament that was then adopted by the Christians. And when the Christians started using it, the Jews rejected it. Do you know that? Did you know the Jewish reaction to the use of the Septuagint? The word Septuagint comes from Latin. Septuaginta means 70. The tradition says 70 Jews translated the first five books of Moses into Greek about 280 years before the Lord. But because that Greek version became the possession of the Greek-speaking church and the Greek-speaking church used it as their official Old Testament, the Jews rejected the Septuagint. And so in the second century, second century, second century, after the birth of our Lord, there were three individuals, two of them proselytes who converted to Judaism, that produced their own version of the Old Testament into Greek. Are you guys listening? Old Testament into Greek. In order to supplant the Septuagint, so in the second century, in the hundreds, three individuals, two who were converts to Judaism, produced their own translations of the Old Testament to Greek to supplant the Septuagint, but it faded into obscurity. In fact, it's so faded out, most of you are probably shocked to hear about it, but Origen made copies of these Greek versions, and these Greek versions were produced by three. Remember the names. Semachus, Semachus, Aquila, Aquila, and Theodosian. The translation of Theodosian, of Semachus, and Aquila or Aquila. Origen had copies of those, those Old Testament translations to Greek, and he had produced what he called the Hexapla. And there are copies of that work. Origen. Yeah, by the way, Orthochristos, you can do me a favor. I don't want you to take what I say for granted because I'm trusting the Holy Spirit to perfect my recall of the facts and destroy all error and sin in us. But you can Google these names and see if I'm right, just to fact check me. It's a beautiful thing about Google. Origen produced what he called the Hexapla, and we still have copies of that. Did you know that Origen took the Hebrew Old Testament and then he transliterated the Old Testament 
using Greek characters to rep the, represent the Hebrew words. And then he also included the Septuagint, Theodosian, Aquila, Aquila, and Semachos. So it's called the Hexapla, meaning the six versions of the Old Testament. The Hexapla. He had six. He had the Hebrew Old Testament with Hebrew letters. And then a Greek transliteration of the Hebrew. Then the Septuagint, Semachos, Aquila, Aquila, and Theodosian lined up. It's called the Hexapla. The Hexapla. All right, check it out. So you guys got these facts that you need to know? You guys got these facts? Everyone got it now? All right. Yes, Justin Martyr was talking about the Jews rejecting the translation of the 70. I even quoted him for these other versions that were perversions because he mentioned that these other Greek versions were mistranslating the Hebrew in defiance of the translation of the 70 because the Christians took the transla translation of the 70 as inspired and authoritative. Okay, we got it now? I can't go fast. I don't want to be too slow. I don't want to be too fast, and I don't want to be boring, but I want to be informative so you can learn by the power of the Holy Spirit the depth of your faith and the history. Okay, you caught it? So why did they make these translations? Because the Jews who were scattered could not read or write Hebrew. And then some of them could not read or write Aramaic. So for the benefit of the Jews who could only read and write Greek, they produce a Greek translation. For the benefit of those Jews who could read and write Aramaic, they produce an Aramaic translation. The Aramaic translation are called Targumim. Now, those of you who speak Syriac, you Chaldeans and Surioyo, Targum, what does that mean? Targum, Targum. When you say to someone, Targum, Targum, you're saying, translate, explain. That's why they're called the Aramaic Targums. Targumim. You with me there? Take care. You understand now where that word is, why it's called Targum? And it's in Aramaic. By the way, to just show you the power and influence of the Aramaic language, the Jews also codified the rabbinic tradition in what's known as the Jerusalem Talmud and the Babylonian Talmud. Google this. Jerusalem Talmud. That was produced in the 400s AD, 5th century. It's in Aramaic. The Babylonian Talmud, that was produced in the 500s AD, 6th century, and it's in Aramaic. Notice it's Aramaic. Get rid of all these shows we're commenting. All right? It's in Aramaic. Everyone with me so far? I'm giving you the history. So with the Aramaic Targums, you're not simply getting a translation. What you're getting is a commentary explaining the Hebrew Old Testament into Aramaic for those Jews who could only read and write Aramaic. Everyone got it? Don't worry, I'm going to get rid of people. So You understand now, right? So for the Greek Orthodox... The official translation of the church was the Septuagint. That was the first production of the Old Testament in Greek. But because the Jews saw that the Christians were using that version, they discarded and discredited that version and came up with competing translations in the second century and from AD 1 to AD 99. No, I'm sorry. That's not the second century. AD 101 to AD 199, second century in the hundreds. And three individuals produced their own translations, which never caught on, never accepted by the church, and obviously faded into obscurity. Okay, you learned that now, right? A lot of unpacking that I have to do for you to learn. Trusting the Spirit will correct my errors and enable you to recall the facts. 
This is our history. Justin Martyr in his debate with Trifo the Jew even lambasts him and the rabbis for rejecting the translation of the 70. He even says it. Here, let me show you my article. Now. Let's go here. All right. Justin Martyr, he mentions it, how they tampered with the scriptures and came up with their own translations of the Greek because they wanted to supplant the translation. And here it is, Justin Martyr on the Jewish corruption of the scriptures. I've done sessions on this, but here's the article. He mentions it. And he shows examples of how these other translations in the Greek were mistranslating the Hebrew into Greek in order to rob Christians of messianic prophecies. I'll give you an example. I'm going to give you an example of what I mean. Isaiah 7.14 comes up right here. Here, talking to Trifo, chapter 71. The Jews reject the interpretation of the Sept Septuagint, from which, moreover, they have taken away passages. So Justin says to Trifo, but I'm far from putting reliance on your teachers and your teachers. I don't believe your teachers. They're liars who refuse to admit that the interpretation made by the 70 elders. That's a Septuagint, guys. This is your history. Who are with Ptolemy, the king of Egyptians, is a correct one. And they attempt to frame another. See, he's acknowledging you came up with your own Greek versions. And I wish you to observe that they have altogether taken away Many scriptures from the translations affected by those 70 elders who were with Ptolemy. So we have copies of the Greek translation done by the 70 Jews. And you have these versions in Greek to supplant this translation. And when we look at your versions, we see you have verses missing or mistranslations. Showing you how dishonest and wicked you are. See right here. By the 70, right? And I even give you the link where you can see it. Now, let me give you an example of what they did. You want to see an example of how they mistranslated Isaiah 714 into Greek in order to deceive people into thinking this is a prophecy of the virgin birth? Watch here. He mentions it. If you read the Greek of Isaiah 714, it says, part. Parthenos, Parthenos, a virgin will conceive. Parthenos, Parthenos. In the Greek translations done in the second century, they translated the word Ha'alma as Nianis, Nianis, a young woman. So he mentioned it right here. Here, watch here. For you assent to those which I have brought before your attention, except that you contradict the statement. Behold, the virgin, Greek, Parthenos, shall conceive. And you say it ought to read, Behold, the young woman. And in the Greek word, woman is Nianis. Nianis. But the translation of the 70 said, Parthenos, a virgin will conceive. They went ahead and changed it to young woman. This guy's on drugs. Who said the Jewish Torah is different? Oh, my goodness, man. Everyone got it? Do you understand what they did? The Greek rendering of Isaiah 714 by the 70, which is the translation that the Greek-speaking Christians accept, says Parthenos. Parthenos. That means virgin. But... When these other translations were produced in the second century, they translated the Hebrew as Nianis. Nianis means young woman, not virgin. And the Christians are already notifying and commenting and sharing these distortions with the Christians of their day, warning them, and calling out the Jews for endorsing these corruptions. You see it? Nothing new under the sun. Nothing new under the sun. The ancient church already dealt with these heresies. The only thing is that these ancient heresies are being repackaged. Same heresies, but repackaged. 
not the Immaculate Conception. Immaculate Conception refers to Mary being kept pure. Okay, everyone got it now? The difference? But you were not aware of these other Greek versions, were you? Crystals and everyone else, right? Because see the goodness of God? These translations faded and are lost to time, but the Septuagint remains to this day. Yep, you got it. Glory to the Holy Trinity, got it. The one official translation of the Greek that is endured to this day is the one in the hands of the church. The others that were produced to supplant that translation faded into obscurity. But notice that these church theologians, warriors, lions of the faith, already were aware of these facts, caught wind of these facts, and exposed these facts to protect the flock of Jesus Christ. See it? Yeah, man, excellent. Yep, you got it. Protestants have that same spirit. Here it is. One more time, if you think I'm lying, I'm going to click here. You can read this online. This is Justin Martyr's debate with Trifo and his Jewish friends. And it's all online for free in English. There it is. Boom. Just go to the article. Let me get it to you. And he says it. Let me read this. Then we go into the... Yeah, Justin, I know. It's very easy, right? That's why you're going to get the lot here because you stupid, dumb bastard. Don't tell me how to run my channel. You dumb bastard. The reason why I have the chat so I can engage people and ask questions to see if they're getting it. You stupid spiritual bastard, you filthy dog, now you're muzzled. That's why I don't close it, so I can engage people. That's why it's a class, so I can be used by the Spirit to engage people. You dumb bastard, you think you're smart. You're lucky I don't spit on you because my spit is better than you. All right, anyway. So you got it here, right? It's all there. What? How does he begin here? Look how he begins. He's talking to Trifo and the chapter of Sephenim. The Jews reject the interpretation of the Septuagint, from which, moreover, they have taken away some passages. So he says to Trifo, but I am far from putting reliance in your teachers who refuse to admit that the interpretation done made by the seven elders who were with Ptolemy, the king of Egyptians, this is about 280 years before the birth of our Lord, is a correct one, and they attempt to frame another. Capiche? We got it? We got it? Yeah, you're not trying to ignore the rules, and you ignore the rules because you're a stupid, dumb bastard too. May dogs piss on all of you. All right, anyone, we got it? All right. So there you go. People don't respect the rules. And they wonder why I cussed them out and their ancestors. I'll start every session. Respect the rules. I'm going to cuss you out because you're bastard sons of horse. And then you wonder why I do that. All right. Everyone got it, right? Okay. So there's the article. So with that as a background, this is to show you these are translations done by Jews for the benefit of Jews. For Jews who could read and write Aramaic, they... Translated the Old Testament into Aramaic, but it's more of a commentary and a paraphrase because it gives you an idea of how the Jews understood the Old Testament. Similarly, when they translate into Greek, they at times gave you a paraphrase or an explanation, not a literal translation. Keep that in mind, right? So that said, where do we find the Trinity in Genesis? Let me remind you, and we're going to go into the Jewish sources. We're going to go into the Jewish sources. Well, let me remind you. So let's go into the Bible one more time. And I'm going to show you from the Old Testament and Jewish sources, the Jews could see a trinity here. Were they aware of the trinity? No. Did this lead them to systematize these facts and come up with the doctrine of the trinity? No. They knew about these passages. And they struggled with what they were reading. And they didn't know how to explain the data. 
It took the church of Jesus Christ to do that. Everyone with me? So let's get into it. Let's get into it. Demons keep manifesting and they keep calling me. All right. All right, let's go here. Let's now let's go back again. First of all, I'm going to show you some interesting facts. These things you know, but let's do this. All right. Okay, Genesis 126, 3, 5, 22. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness so that they will have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So let us make man in our image and our likeness. Now watch the plurals here. We're going to get into that in a minute, but I want to show you the other plurals. Genesis 3, 5. For God knows, this is a serpent telling Eve, for God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. You'll be like God, knowing good and evil. Now, literally, here it's plural. You'll be like Elohim. The Elohim, they know good and evil. It's a plural. I'll show it to you in a minute. But before I do that, to show you that this God who knows good and evil is plural, look what God says in Genesis 3.22. Then Yahweh God said, Be whole. The man has become like one of us. Yahweh God, behold, the man has become like one of us. One of us to know good and evil. Are you catching it here? One of us. The question is, who is Yahweh speaking to? Who are the us? That's what we're going to unpack if you listen. And here, literally, the, the word knowing is plural. You'll be like God as they know good and evil. I'll show you that in a minute. And to prove that God here is being referred to in the plural, Elohim, they know good and evil. It's confirmed right here. Behold, the man has become like one of us, one of us. So now how do we account for these plurals found in the first three chapters of Genesis? Class has begun. Stay focused, Lord. Increase our numbers for your glory, honor, praise. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. All right. How do we know or how do we know that these plurals refer to the Trinity or is it referring to someone else? Now, sadly, let me show you the fruit. See, like this dumbass right here. This dumbass right here, this uh, whore right here, because he's a whore. He just anticipated what I'm about to destroy because he's a dumbass spiritual whore of his father, the devil, who follows scholarship that he thinks is credible. And here he's, he thinks that it's God speaking to the heavenly host. Thank you, dumbass, for making that comment because I'm going to butcher and slaughter people like you who sadly have been influenced by Heiser. Okay, you see it? No, it's not his fault. He's a spiritual bastard, son of the devil who's being influenced by this kind of scholarship. Let me show you what scholarship he's being influenced by. And anti-Trinitarians like Tovia Singer and Muslims quote these scholars who claim to be evangelical or even Catholic and Trinitarians to show, no, there's no Trinity here. Watch the notes. Oh, boy. It's not opening now. Yeah. See, Satan was working overtime. Watch the notes. Let's see. Let's see here. Lord, rebuke evil, rebuke distractions in Jesus' name. See, it's not working. So I got to go here. Yeah, What's going on? I don't know. All right. Pray against all distractions of the enemy. Yeah, lots of spirit. I'm going to bury you in your divine counsel, you bastard. Just wait. Okay, watch right here, the note. Then God said, let us make. Now, here I'm going to enlarge it. I want you to see. Now, these are evangelicals, and many of them are professors, and they teach in seminaries. Look what they're teaching their students. You ready? Look what they're teaching their students. You see this right here? Okay, you see it right here? To your right, let me enlarge it. I don't know why it's not working over there. 
Lord have mercy. Okay, so let's go here. Here we go. Let's go here. Let us make, man. Sorry, brethren. We got to figure this out. Hmm. Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy. Lord to the fallen. All this only spirit in Jesus' mighty name. Okay. I'm sorry. Well, I don't know what happened. See all these distractions of Satan. Glory to the Father, the Son, the Spirit. All right, let's try this again. Why is it going to 47? I don't know. Hold on. All right. Yep, see, it gives us problems. Now, the Bible gateway is not working. I don't know why. Okay, let's try this again. Let's see here. Gone in a trap and I can't walk out. Oh, la, la, la. Oh, Satan always kind to distract. Father, rebuke Satan. Lord Jesus, rebuke Satan. Holy Spirit, rebuke Satan in Jesus' name. All right, now it's working here. All right, so we go here. Finally. All right. Now it open up here. I don't know why it didn't open up there. Okay. Footnotes. So now let's see how they render it. Okay, here you go. Ready? Finally, I got it to open. Everyone with me? Everyone with me? You're listening? Now remember, these are evangelical Trinitarians who believe in the Trinity, right? Look at their notes, which is why time on that dumb bastard thinks that it's a divine council. Watch her. The plural form of the verb has been the subject of much discussion through the years, and not surprisingly, several suggestions have been put forward. Many Christian theologians interpret it as an early hint of plurality within the Godhead. But this view imposes later Trinitarian concepts on the ancient text. You see what they just did? See what they did? With friends like these, do you need enemies? When you have so-called evangelical scholars who think they are doing the church a service and honoring Christ by making such comments, why would you need Muslims and Jews to bash the faith? They're doing a good job of destroying your case from the Trinity, and I'm going to show you the contrast with the early church. I'm going to show you how the early church interpreted Genesis 1. I have an article on this. But this view imposes later Trinitarian Constitution text, text. Some have suggested the plural verb indicates majesty, but the plural majesty is not used with verbs, so that goes out the window. It's not plural majesty. You don't use majestic form of speaking of the deity with verbs. So then what's the answer? See Westerman argues for a plural of deliberation here, but his proposed examples of this use do not actually support his theory. Theory, So that goes out the window. In 2 Samuel 24, 14, David uses the plural as representative of all Israel. In Isaiah 6, 8, the Lord speaks on behalf of his heavenly court. You see, this is where that dumb bastard got the divine counsel. Because God is talking to the angels, his heavenly host. In its ancient Israelite context, the plural is most naturally understood as referring to God and his heavenly court. You see what I just did? How can it most naturally refer to God and his heavenly court when no angel was involved in creating anything in creation, let alone man? And by angel, I mean a created angel. See what they did? Say that? The most no, well-known members of this court are God's message angels. In Genesis 5, the serpent may refer to this group as God's divine beings. See the note on the word evil. If this is the case, God invites the heavenly court to participate at the creation of humankind, even though none of them created anything, perhaps in the role of offering praise. You see, with scum like this, you don't need enemies. But he himself is the one who does the actual creative work. You see, they see the contradiction. You see? So they're admitting God himself does the creating, but he's talking to the angels who do nothing to create, but only observe. So as he's telling them, let us make man in our image. Of course, this view does assume that the members of the court possess the divine image in some way. Since the image is closely associated with rulership, perhaps they share the divine image in that they, together with God, and under his royal authority, are the executive authority of the world. See that? 
Okay, now how do they interpret Genesis 3, 22 and 3, 5 here? For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now watch their note. Like divine beings who know. So they're saying the word Elohim can be plural, like gods. You'll be like gods, the divine beings, right? It is unclear how the plural participle translated knowing. So the word knowing is plural. Those who are knowing, the knowing ones. So they're admitting in Hebrew, right? Yadi is plural. So that it's saying, this God, they are the ones knowing. Plural. But since they don't want to use this as an argument for the Trinity, I'll say, well, then it may mean the gods, the ones who are knowing good and evil. So it's referring to God and Emily Council. See what they're doing? You caught it? You caught it, right? You understand what they're telling you? If you, uh, I'm going to go slow. It may not be as exciting. Pair of numbers increase, not decrease. So people learn the facts. They're admitting to you that in Hebrew, yodi, yodi is plural. It's a plural participle. It's referring to more than one. The one's knowing. But it's here used for God, Elohim. But now they're perplexed. Why is it plural? Why is it saying God, the ones knowing good and evil? Well, maybe because it's the Trinity? No, that can't be. Maybe it's the heavenly host. They are divine beings and they know good and evil. So look what they say. On the one hand, Yodi could be taken as a sub substantival participle functioning as a predicate, predicative adjective in the sentence. In this case, one might translate you will be like god himself knowers of good and evil see how desperate they are so now it's not saying god is the one knowing good and evil but it's saying you adam and eve will be the knowers of good and evil and in that way you'll be like god anything to get away from saying it's the trinity on the other hand it could be taken as an attributive adjective modifying elohim that it's now speaking of elohim in this case elohim has to be taking as a numerical plural referring to God. See, the notion of the Trinity does not even enter the conversation. It's either a predicative adjective saying that Adam and Eve will be the knowers of good and evil like God, or it's referring to the divine beings, and they are the ones who know good and evil, but it can't refer to the Trinity. See it? This is NET Bible, folks. See it? The love of academia. These scholars want the praise of the world and academia and liberal critical scholarship that will laugh at you if you think that the Old and New Testaments are inspired by the same God and have the same theology and that God is the Trinity. They laugh at you. So they want the respect of the world. They want the love of academia. They want the love of scholars who think you're a joke for believing that Christ died and rose again. Or that God inspired books and these books are historically accurate. So they want to sound intelligent to them. You see? They betrayed the church. That's what they've done. They betrayed the church. They want the love of the world. I would say to the world, stick it where the sun don't shine. And I'm running out of toilet paper, so give me your PhDs because I can use it for toilet paper. This is what I think of your scholarship. Okay, watch. Then I'm going to show you the church fathers and writers. In this case, Elohim has to be taken as a numerical plural. That means it's got to be God's if the word for knowing is plural, right? Because look what they say. Because if the one true God were the intended referent, a singular form of the part participle would appear as a modifier. See it? Following this line of inter interpretation, one can translate, you'll be like divine beings who know good and evil. The following context may support this translation. For in 322, God says to an unidentified group, 
Look, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. It is possible that God, like that dumb bastard Timon said, is addressing this heavenly court. You see? Exactly, Mello. Michael Heiser is a brother in the Lord who's wrestling with the Lord, but here he was wrong and influenced by liberal critical scholarship. And people who cannot think critically but are stupid and parrot what other scholars say will then parrot these arguments without thinking deeply and critically to show why it's wrong. And why should I take the view of Heiser over against Justin Martyr, Irenaeus, Tertullian, these ancient writers, theologians, and martyrs who were taught by the bishops, who were taught by the apostles? Now I'm going to show you. The early church was consistent. These all refer to the Trinity. Show you. You'll see. I have an article on this. So members of which can be called God. So God is a heavenly court, and they can be called God or divine heavenly beings from the ancient is like perspective. We know some of these beings are messengers or angels. So then it goes on to this long rant. An examination of parallel construction shows that a predicative understanding you will be knowers of good and evil like god is possible yeah it can mean that where harry's predicative come complement the, the verb to be other evidence suggests that the participle is attributed so they're admitting the evidence is overwhelming that it's saying god knows good and evil but since the word know is plural it can't mean the one god it has to mean the heavenly council instead of seeing this as a proof of the trinity and all of these texts where a comparative clause and accompanying adjective participle follow a copulative to be verb, the adjective participle is attributive. It's saying something, right? It's attributing something <clears throat> to that noun mentioned, which would be God <clears throat> in Genesis 3, 5. After the noun, the comparative clause. The translation of God, though, is supported by how Elohim is used in the surrounding context. So they're admitting to you the word Elohim used in Genesis 1 and 3. It refers to the one God, <clears throat> not to the gods, as used in the surrounding context, but always refers to the true God, and many translations take it this way. NIV, TNI, RSV, NRSV, excuse me, ESV, HCSV, NLT, NASB, REB, NKJV. In this interpretation, the plural parts refer to Adam and Eve. You caught it? See what they did? Look what it says here. Oh, boy. The man has become one, like one of us. See note 126.35, meaning meaning like one of us, the divine council, like that dumb bastard Timon re repeated. All right. Now let's see the church father, shall we? Now look at the difference. Go to my article. You put in Genesis pronouns, early church. Okay. Let's, let's see if we can find it. The early church's interpretation of the Hebrew Bible's use of plural pronouns for God. Here you go. Bam. Now watch the difference between Michael Heiser, these evangelicals or Catholics. Tim, may the Shia free your whore mother. They have locked her up in Iran doing muta with that whore, giving birth to bastard whores like you. Free Tim's mother, that Shia whore. Anyway, here it is. Come on, mods, be faster than blocking these dogs. Now, guys, Ortho Christos Lepanto, do you want to see the difference between the early church, those taught by the apostles and their successors, and modern scholarship that claim to be Trinitarian? Look how they interpret all of these. Watch. Genesis 11, 7, come, let us go down. Or Isaiah 6, 8, whom shall I send who go for us? How do they interpret it? Let's begin. I'm not going to look at all of it. But there's plenty of citations. I give you Old and New Testaments to prove to you it's the Trinity here. Epistle of Barnabas. Who was God speaking to when he said, let us make man in our image? Epistle of Barnabas. Okay, so he talks about the Lord who endured to lure up his flesh in corruption that we might sanctify through the mission of sins, which is affected by his blood of sprinkling, 
For it is written concerning him, who? The Lord who died for us. And what was written? To whom God said at the foundation of the world, let us make man after our image and after our likeness. Did you catch it? The epistle of Barnabas, written in the first century. First century. A first century writing. And here you have the oldest extent surviving writing from the early church showing you how they understood the plurals. It's the father speaking to the son. You see it? So who cares what Mike Heiser said? What makes him any more special? All right. Let's see. Does he say it again? Here you go. Chapter 6. Since therefore having renewed us by the remission of our sins, he hath made us after another pattern. It is his purpose that we should possess the soul of children inasmuch as he has created us anew by his spirit. So you have the spirit here. For the scripture says concerning us, while he speaks to the son, let us make man after our image and after our likeness. Who did he say this to? Father said to the son. Son, let us make man after our image, after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the beasts of the earth, the fowls of heaven, the fish of the sea. And the Lord said, I'm beholding the fair creature, man, increase and multiply, replenish the earth. These things were spoken to the son. We got it? So you want me to follow Michael Heiser, Daniel Wallace, not... Epistle Barnabas, Ignatius, Justin Martyr, Tertullian. Why? What makes them more special than these ancient writers? Here, Ignatius of Antioch. Epistle to the Anto Antiochians. Now, some say it's spurious, but even if it's spurious, it's not a genuine letter of Ignatius. It's still an early letter around the second century, and it still tells you how the Christians interpreted Genesis, okay? For most, for Moses, the faithful servant, when he said, the Lord your God is one Lord, and thus proclaimed that there is only one Lord, did yet immediately confess also our Lord, meaning Jesus, when he said, the Lord, that's our Lord Jesus, who's on earth, is Genesis 19, 24, reigned upon Sodom and Gomorrah, fire and brimstone from the Lord. So notice the ancient Christians are quoting these very, Old Testament passages that we quote today to prove the Trinity in the Old Testament, again showing you we didn't discover anything. They already knew it. It may be new to us, but it was old news for them. And where else do we find the Son be being mentioned? And again, and God said, let us make man after our image. And so God made man after the image of God, made he him, and for the image of God made he man. And that the Son of God was made to be man, Moses says, a prophet shall the Lord raise up unto you of your brethren like me. You caught it? You caught it? So according to this writing, even if it's not from Ignatius, at least it's from the second century, and here you have Christians telling you, Genesis 19, 24, the Lord Jove on earth is the Son, and the Lord Jove in heaven is the Father. And they use these passages the way we use them to show the Trinity. And that God the Father is speaking to the Son when he says, let us make man in our image. What about Justin Martyr? Justin Martyr. Look, the words, let us make man, agree with the testimony of Proverbs. So Justin... Who was God talking to? According to Timon, that dumb bastard, following highs and others, stood on a heavenly council. And the same sentiment was expressed, my friends, by the word of God, written by Moses, when it indicated with regards to him, whom it has point, pointed out, that God speaks in the creation of man with the very same design in the following words. Let us make man after our image, after our likeness. So who is that? And that you may not change the force of the word, just quote it, and repeat what your teachers assert. Look what he says. You Jews, 
say that God is speaking to the heavenly council. Did you hear that, Heiser? May you rest in peace. Your teachers say that either God said to himself, plural of majesty, let us make, just as when we are about to do something, often say to ourselves, let us make, or that God spoke to the elements, to wit, the earth and other similar substances of which we believe man was formed, let us make, I shall quote again, the words narrated by Moses himself, from which we can indisputably learn that God conversed with someone who was numerically distinct from himself and also a rational being. These are the words. So who is God speaking to, Justin? And God said, behold, Adam has become as one of us. Oh, that's Genesis 3.22. Are you telling me, Justin, that's not the heavenly council? You know, good and evil. And saying, therefore, as one of us, Moses has declared that there is a certain number of persons associated with one another and that there are at least two. Well, who are they? Here you go, Heiser. For I would not say that the dogma of that heresy, which is said to be among you, meaning you Jews, is true, or that the teachers of it can prove that God spoke to angels. Wait, you're telling me the early Christians condemned the view championed by Michael Heiser and others that God was speaking to angels? It was already condemned by the early church because that was not an argument of Christians. It was the arguments of the enemies of the Trinity. Do you caught it? You see, if you don't know history, you're going to be duped and hoodwinked into following these views that the church already condemned and exposed and refuted. So these guys who praise Michael Eiser, he's a great man. I'm not saying he's not a Christian and he's resting in the peace of the Lord. He was wrong. He was off. And his view was already commented on and condemned by the heirs of the apostles. What are you not getting? What are you not getting? Everyone got it? You know, I'm not going to finish this today. I just hope you know that. But I just want to go through slowly. Exactly. Have you noticed it? All these Christians were dummies. They were church children, ignoramuses. But these scholars today, they're the wise ones and the brilliant because they got Bible software, logos. They have accordance. They have databases. So they are much smarter than them. In other words, the Lord did a terrible job of allowing the wrong people to copy the scriptures, preserve the scriptures, explain the scriptures, and defend the church. Because if we follow what they say, these guys were a bunch of idiots. That's why, Candace, you study history, you'll never be Calvinist, and you're going to cease being Protestant. Are you catching it? Before I move on, Lepanto Orthochristos, is this mind-blowing? How the early church already condemned and refuted the view that God is speaking to the angels and called it a heresy held by the Jews? Is everyone enjoying this? Crystals, I don't know if she's here. Kitty day soon. Exactly, Crystals. Nothing new. They already refute it's new to us because we're ignorant of our ancestors, our spiritual forebears. Thank you, Lord, for opening my heart to the early church. That's why I left Protestantism. I'm being honest. I could not stay Protestant. And you see why I love these men? I love Justin Martyr. I love Tertullian, though he's not a church father and sadly fell, fell after Montanus. Still, he was a Trinitarian till the end. Why I love these men? Because they knew things. And saw things that put us to shame. And they didn't have the Bible between two covers. They didn't have search engines, software. 
They had to write everything by hand and memorize the Bible, putting us to shame, showing we're jokes in comparison. All right, now let's continue. Don't ask the relevant questions. Focus. Okay, Justin. He's not speaking to angels or the human frame was the workmanship of angels. So who is he talking to? Here you go. But this offspring, which was truly brought forth from the Father, was with the Father before all creatures. He was talking to the Son. His true spiritual offspring, who exists within him, sprung forth from him, inseparable from him, and who was there before all creation, so he's not created. It was his offspring who became Jesus that the Father was talking to. Even as the scripture by Solomon has made clear that he whom Solomon calls wisdom was begotten as a begetting, beginning, meaning he was within God and came forth from God to begin creation by creating all creatures. As an offspring by God, who has also declared the same thing in the revelation made by Joshua, son of Nave. See? What about Irenaeus? What about Irenaeus? What did he say? So this is why I'm going to have to do a part five. You know that, right? You guys knew I was going to do part five. And it's all online. You can read it for free. And I'll put this in the description box. Irenaeus, let's go. Long, the, the quotes are long, so I'm going to go to the salient points, okay? Okay. So mankind was formed after likeness of God. And how did God create mankind? And molded by his hands, that is, by the Son of Spirit, to whom he also said, let us make man. Bam, in your face. Irenaeus said, God was speaking to the Son and the Spirit. And he told the Son and the Spirit, let us make man. And the Son and Spirit are the hands of God because God is not a physical being. So these are not physical hands, but hands, meaning he has two because he has two divine persons who fulfill his will and do all things according to his pleasure. You see it? You guys caught it? Irenaeus, God is not a physical being. Yes. So what are his hands? His hands are not physical parts, but persons, two hands, son and spirit, because they are the power of God that God uses to create all things. And it was to the son and the spirit that God said, let us make man. Okay. So there you go. What about chapter 20? Here again. It's very long, but I just want to go to the salient points. Okay. And God formed man, taking clay of the earth, and breathed into his, his face the breath of life. It was not angels. Damn. What happened, Heiser? Should have read your church history. N-E-T. It was not angels, therefore, who made us, nor who formed us. Neither had angels the power to make man make an image of God, nor anyone else except the word of the Lord, nor any power remotely distinct, distant from the Father of all things. For God did not stand in need of these beings in order to accomplishing of what he had himself determined with himself beforehand should be done, as if he did not possess his own hands, meaning his spiritual hands, which are persons, because hand means power. The Son is the power of God. The Spirit is the power of God. That's why he has two hands, because they're two persons. For with him were always present the word and wisdom. Now notice who wisdom is here. The spirit, the word and wisdom, the son and spirit, by whom and in whom freely and spontaneously he made all things, to whom also he speaks, saying, let us make man after our image, after our likeness. So who do you want me to follow? N.E.T.? Dallas Theological Seminary professors, Michael Heiser, or the early church? Who do you want me to follow? 
Notice they're all in agreement. And where do they get this from? Irenaeus is the disciple of Polycarp. Polycarp, the disciple of the apostles. An eyewitness of John. Where do you think they're getting this from? The bishops who taught them the faith. And those are the bishops who were taught by the apostles themselves. But forget about them. You know, you know, we needed to wait for Dallas Theological Seminary and Daniel Wallace and Michael Heiser and Bible Software and Logos. What about origin? For the Son of God, the firstborn of all creation, although he seemed recently to have become incarnate, is no by no it's not by any means and by the way he's not a church father origin he was condemned as a heretic for his heretical views about pre-existence of souls and so forth but he still died in unity the church whereas Tertullian left the church for the holy scriptures know him to be the most ancient of all the works of creation for it was to him that God said regarding creation of man let us make man in our image after our likeness hmm what about Tertullian Look at here. The man ought not to cover his head for as much as his image of God. Since then, see his image of the creator. For he, when looking on Christ's word, was to become man, said, let us make man in our image. So God, speaking to his word, said, let us make man in our image. Oh. What's going on here? What? Against Martian. What about chapter 12? Look at here. Tertullian. If the number of the Trinity also offends you, as if we're not connected in the simple unity, I ask you how it is possible for a being who's merely and absolutely one and singular to speak in plural phrase saying, let us make man in our image. So Tertullian, he's now going to quote Genesis 126, Genesis 3.22, Genesis 11.7, and look how he explains it. So Tertullian, who's God talking to? Whereas he ought to have said, let me make man in my own image, after my own likeness, as being a unique and singular being. In the following passage, however, behold, the man has become as one of us. He is either deceiving or amusing us in speaking plurally, if he is own, one and only and singular, meaning one person. Notice again, he condemns the view of Mike Heiser. Or was it to the angels that he spoke as the Jews interpret the passage? Are you seeing? The fathers are all consistent. The writers are all consistent. God is not speaking to angels. That's a Jewish heresy to deny the Trinity. But these passages is the Trinity. The Father speaking to the Son and the Spirit. They're all consistent, right? Different writers writing at different times, sometimes in different languages, in different parts of the world, and they all agree God is not speaking to angels. That's a Jewish heresy. It's the Father speaking to the Son and the Spirit. Coincidence? But today with evangelical scholars, sola scriptura, tota scriptura, they're all over the map. Okay. So watch here. So he's not speaking to angels as the Jews interpret the passage because these also acknowledge not the Son. See, the Jews don't believe there's a Son. Or was it because he was at once the Father, Son, and the Spirit that he spoke to himself in plural terms, making himself plural on that very account? He's talking about modalism that says it's one person, three modes. Then who was it, Tertullian? Nay, it was because he already he had already his son close at his side as a second person, his own word, and a third person also, the Spirit and the Word, because the Word, Jesus, and the Spirit are inseparable. So he's a third person that he purposely adopted the plural phrase, let us make in our image, become one of us. Oh, so it's the Trinity, Tertullian? For with whom did he make man? And to whom did he make him like? The answer must be, not the heavenly council, the Son on the one hand, who was one day to put on human nature, and the Spirit on the other, who was to sanctify man. With these did he then speak in the unity of the Trinity. And there are people who say Tertullian wasn't a Trinitarian. As with his ministers and witnesses. In the following text also, he distinguishes among the persons. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. So he's saying, see, this he is distinct from God. God created man in the image of God. Why say image of God? Why not his own image merely? 
if he is only one, meaning person, who was the maker, and if there was not also one in whose image he made man. But there was one in whose image God was making man, that is to say, Christ's image. So the image of God here means the image of God, the Son, Jesus Christ. That's what he's telling you. Okay, sinking in? Is it sinking in? You're enjoying it? Because we'll do part five tomorrow. Claudius, pay attention, sister, please. We're going to finish with the early church, and then we're going to go more in depth. And I'll put this in the description box. Right? So I'm going to have to hold off finishing everything else. We got to finish the series. You see, when we do not know church history, we will be deceived and hoodwinked into following every wind and wave of doctrine. I am thankful for the Lord. The Spirit put a fire in my heart to learn about the church writers and fathers. Because you see, now I know why Heiser is wrong. Daniel Wallace is wrong. These scholars are wrong. They're wrong. And I'm not impressed with their scholarship. Well, Heiser says, what, is Heiser Paul? Well, you're not Paul either. No, but I'm following Paul and his heirs, the early church. Okay, let's continue. So we are made in the image of Christ, our God, because one day he was about to become man, more surely and more truly so, had already caused the man to be called his image, who was then going to be formed of clay, the image and similitude of the true and perfect man. But in respect of the previous works of the world, what says the scripture? Now watch. Its first statement indeed is made when the Son was not yet appeared. Because the Son, according to Turlin, was within God, residing within God as the Logos of God, whom God communed with. Then when God wanted to create, he summoned his logos from within him to spring forth from him, his mind, his bosom, without severing from him. And then that act, when he sprung forth and became now personally distinguishable, that's when the Father used the Son to create everything. And God said, let there be light. There was light. Immediately there appears the word. So that light, according to Turlian, is when the word came forth to shine light into the world and make it alive. Which lights man on his coming into the world? Because he's taking John 1 at face value to understand Genesis. And through him also came light upon the world. From that moment, God willed creation to be affected in the word, Christ being present and ministering unto him. And so God created God said, let there be a firmament, and God made the firmament. God also said, let there be lights in the firmament, and so God made a greater and lesser light. But all the rest of the created things did he in like manner who made the four ones, I mean the word of God, because he's the one, quoting John now, through whom all things were made, and without him nothing was made. Now if he too is God, according to John, who says the word was God, and he's using it to destroy modalism. If you guys don't know who Praxis is, Praxis taught, Jesus is the Father, and they're not three persons. Another heresy destroyed by the early church long before modern oneness heretics. Their arguments are already destroyed, and he's using the Old Testament to show there are several persons already existing together as God modalists. The word was God, and you have two beings, one that commands and the, other, and the thing be made, and the other that executes in the order and creates. In one sense, however, you ought to understand him to be another. I've already explained on the ground of personality. They're different persons, but one substance. In the way of distinction, not a division. You can't divide them. They're not two different gods, distinct persons, but their substance is the same. Still not convinced? All right. Here you go. On the resurrected flesh, he quotes John 1 and Genesis. In the first place, because all things were made by the word of God, and without him was nothing made, now the flesh too had its existence from the word of God, because of the principle that here should be nothing without the word. Let us make man. Wait, Tertullian, you're saying God the Father is speaking to Jesus the word in Genesis 1.26? Said he, before he created him and added, with our hand, for the sake of his preeminence. 
that so he might not be compared with the rest of creation. So you don't think that Jesus is a creature. He's not. He created all things. And he dignified man to be higher than all creatures because man would be the one that the word would then enter into the world and partake of human nature, glorifying mankind. You get it? Are you guys bored or are you enjoying this? Because we're going to end it with the fathers. We got a few more quotes. Not all of them are fathers, though. Let me get you the article. Do not care what modern scholars teach. Do not care what Heiser says. Heiser, a Christian, wrestling with the Lord, but he was wrong. That's why when people think that somehow that his scholarship is unparalleled, in whose mirage? Let's not become Heiserites or Solowitians or Shemunians or any of that thing. We exalt scriptures, the God of scriptures, and we honor the early church there as the apostles. The rest of us are nothing in comparison to them. Oh, but Heiser said, okay, I didn't know Heiser was the 14th apostle. What about Novation? Novation, a long one here, proving that the Father is God, Son is God, Spirit is God, but the Father is not the Son, Son's not the Spirit. Again, refuting ancient modalists who thought that the Son is the Father. And quoting the Old Testament show that already in the Old Testament, you have multiple divine persons. So let me skip to the salient part. For who does not acknowledge that the person of the Son is second after the Father? See, he was refuting oneness heretics. Oneness, your view was condemned in the second century onwards. It's not ancient. It's not biblical. And the real Christians use the Old Testament to bury your lie that Jesus is the Father. Wake up and repent. For who does not acknowledge that the person's son is second after the father? When he reads, wait, what is he going to quote? When he reads what? That it was said by the father, consequently to the son. Wait, they all agree. Did you notice? All of them agree. Different writers writing at different times in different parts of the world, but they all are unanimous that it's the father speaking to the son and the spirit, not to angels. How do they get such unanimity of doctrine? Because they were being taught by the very bishops, taught by the apostles. You caught it? You see it? Are you catching this? Tertullian... Novation, Justin Martyr, Ignatius, Arias, they're all writing at different parts of the world at different times, but they all unanimously agree. God the Father is speaking to the Son and the Spirit in Genesis 1, 26, Genesis 3, 22, Genesis 11, 7, even Isaiah 6, 8, and not to angels. Yet today, modern evangelical, Catholic, Orthodox, Trinitarian scholarship are all over the map. I hope my screen is not blurry. I don't know. I hope not. This is the best we can do. Everyone getting it? Protestant, why are you deleting glory to the Holy Trinity, dude? He's a regular. Take it easy, man. He said we're getting it. He's a regular. Don't got it? All right. Now watch here. Let's continue. So he said to the son, let us make man in our image and our likeness, that after this it was related. And God made man in the image of God made he him. Look at the other passage he quotes. Already in the Old Testament, there are two persons, not one person in different modes, using the Old Testament to destroy oneness heresy. Look at the other one. He quotes Genesis 19.24 where it says, the Lord Yahweh who was on earth reigned upon Sodom and Gomorrah, fire and from the Lord Yahweh from heaven. See, saying, see, you got two again, one of whom is the son. Or when he reads, as having been said to Christ, you are my son, this day I've begotten you. Wow, that's Psalm 2-7, showing you that the son is not the father. 
Ask of me and I will give you the heathens for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. Or when also that the beloved writer says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit on my right hand. He even quotes Psalm 1101. Until I make your enemies the footstool of your feet. Or when unfolding prophecy Isaiah, he finds it written thus. Thus says the Lord to Christ, my Lord. Say what? I'm going to put this article in the description box. Now, if you really want to be disgusted and upset and saddened, do you know that even Jehovah's Witnesses admit, even Jehovah's Witnesses admit that Genesis 1, it's the Father speaking to Jesus, the Son. I even wrote an article on that. You got anti-Trinitarians like Greg Stafford and Joe's Witnesses admitting Genesis 1, Jehovah speaking to the Father. I'm sorry, Lord, save me from error, correct my six. Jehovah the Father speaking to the Son, but we got our own Trinitarian saying, no, it's God speaking to the heavenly council. Here. Let me show you that article. I'm going to put it in the description box later. All right. All right, let me do this. Let me find the article. Sometimes, here we go. Anti-Trinitarians agree. The reason why God in the Old Testament referred to himself in the plural is because he was speaking with his divine son. Can you believe that? Here it is. Here's the article. You got it here? We're going to go out with this. And Lord willing, in part five, we'll go more into it. I just wanted to prepare you. Beware of scholarship. And keep praying for me and my daughters. The Lord grant us miraculous safety, security, protection. Strict discipline to get healthier, eat healthier, exercise more, and to engage in deeper spiritual disciplines to love the Lord more perfectly. My daughters be in love with the Lord, and the Lord bring them to me and provide. Let's see. Watch here. And I'm using the Joe Witness Bible. Who do the Joe's Witnesses say God is speaking to here? Let us make man in our image. Who does Greg Stafford say God is speaking to? Come, let us go down. Or here, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Anti-Trinitarians, what do they say? You ready? Watch this. This is from the Joe Witness booklet, book Commissioning of Witness in the Time of the End, page 215. Look what they say. Look. Isn't it sad? NET Bible notes done by Trinitarians say that God is speaking to the heavenly council. And yet Joe's witnesses admit it's the father speaking to Jesus, the son. Here, who are meant by us in his words? Who will go for us? Why? Jehovah links someone else up with him at the temple when he adds. And who will go for us? That's Isaiah 6, 8. The pronoun us here includes the same ones as are meant when God spoke at creation and said, let us make man. Also, the man has become as one of us. And at Babel, let us go down and there confound their language. So God is speaking to the same ones. Who? Who is that? Genesis 1, 26, 3, 22, 11, 7. So by the plural pronoun us, Joe is meaning not himself and the seraphim at the temple, but himself and his only begotten son. Damn. Who became the man Christ Jesus by whom he had created all things. Hence the glory which Isaiah saw at the temple represented primarily the glory of Jehovah and secondarily that of his son. Damn. Even Jehovah's Witnesses admit this? Are you seeing this? Crystals, Lepanto, Ortho Christos, Kitty, Sarah, all of you, Sonia? Exactly, Christos. When our own Trinitarians and even Catholics say, no, it's God speaking to the council. But then anti trinitarians says, no, it's the Father speaking to the Son. Here. And if you think I'm lying, here it is. I give you the link. There it is. Online. You can read it with your own eyes. I'm not lying. This glory the Son shows forth. When Jehovah sends him as his messenger of the covenant to the temple for judgment work, as it is written, the Lord whom you see, 
will suddenly come to his temple, the messenger of the covenant, whom you desire, behold, he cometh, say, Jovos. And they're admitting that's about Jesus, that he's the Lord of the temple, the messenger of the covenant. At his glorious coming to the temple <laughs> in 1918. <laughs> All right, yeah, okay. All right, how about here? Another Jehovah's Witness. So here you go. Isaiah's prophecy, light for all mankind. Here you go. Right there. Thank God for modern technology. You can destroy all ancient heresies and modern heresies because you can read the fathers and the literature of your own enemies where they are admitting the Trinity is true, even though that's not their intention. Here, what question does Jehovah propound? And whom does he include when he says us? So who is he talking to? Let us listen with Isaiah. I began to hear the voice of Jehovah saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I proceeded to say, Here I am, send me. So who's the us, Jehovah's Witness? The professors at Dallas Theological Seminary tells me it's the Heavenly Council. The question propounded by Jehovah is clearly designed to elicit a response from Isaiah as no other human prophet appears in the vision. It is unmistakably an invitation for Isaiah to be Jehovah's messenger. But why does Jehovah ask who will go for us? Watch. This is them. By switching from the singular personal pronoun I to the plural pronouns, Jehovah now includes at least one other person with himself. <laughs> who? Was this not his only begotten son who later became the man, Jesus Christ? Indeed, it was the same son to whom God said, let us make man on our image. Shame on you, Trinitarians, where even the enemies of the Trinity are admitting it's the Father speaking to the Son, and you say the heavenly council. Yes, alongside Job in the heavenly courts is his only begotten Son. Shame on you. Where the enemies are admitting this is the Father speaking to the Son. And you Trinitarians object. Listen, you're getting this too, right, sister? I know demons manifest, but as long as you're learning. Right? Now watch. Again, this is their resource. Here it is. Should you believe the Trinity? In the booklet, where they're trying to prove to you the Trinity is false. In the booklet. <laughs> In their very booklet that they're trying to disprove the Trinity, they're admitting in this booklet the Father is speaking to the Son. Okay, here. As wisdom in his preeminent existence, Jesus goes on to say that he was by his God's side a master craftsman. In harmony with this role as master craftsman, Colossians 1.16 says of Jesus that through him God created everything in heaven and on earth. So it was by means of this master worker, his junior partner, as it were, that Almighty God created all other things. There goes other situs again, other lightus. The Bible summarizes the matter this way. For us, there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things. It, no doubt, look, selling you, don't you doubt this, Heiser, Dallas Theological Seminary. It, no doubt, was to this master craftsman that God said, let us make man in our image. Don't you dare doubt God was talking to Jesus. Some have claimed that the us and our are in this expression indicate a trinity. But if you were to say, let us make something for ourselves, no one would normally understand this to imply that several persons are combined as one inside of you. What a stupid caricature of the trinity. You simply mean that two or more individuals will work together on something. So too, when God used us and our, he was simply addressing another individual. And they think this individual is created. His first spirit creation, the master craftsman, the pre-human Jesus. Tisk tisk. Tisk tisk. A few more quotes because I want to quote Stafford as well. Again, what do they say here? This comes from Insight on the Scriptures. You can read online. So who is Jehovah the Father speaking to? Jehovah's first creation was his only begotten son in your dreams, <clears throat> the beginning of the creation by God. This one, the firstborn of all creation, was used by Jehovah in creating all other things, those in the heavens and those upon the earth, the things visible and the things invisible. John's inspired testimony concerning this son, the word, is that all things came into existence through him, 
And apart from him, not even one thing came into existence. And the apostle identifies the word as Jesus Christ who had become flesh. As wisdom personified, this one is represented as saying, Job himself produced me as the beginning of his way. And he tells of his association with God, the creator, as Jehovah's master worker. Now watch. In view of the close association of Job and his only begotten son in creative activity, because that son is the image of the invisible God, it was evidently to his only begotten son and master worker that Jehovah spoke in saying, let us make man in our image. After creating his only begotten son, Jehovah used them in bringing them the angels into existence. Damn. Final one from them. And then I'm going to quote Greg Stafford, who's no longer Joe Witness. Okay. Inside of scriptures, volume two. Okay. Are you guys enjoying this? Are you guys enjoying this? Are you now seeing, do not be impressed, intimidated, or swayed by modern scholars, no matter how much you love them, even if they're Trinitarian like Heiser? Not even me, because I'm not infallible. Do not be swayed. That's why when they tell me the scholar said this, I don't give a damn. Well, Heiser said this. Okay, and? So what do you want me to do? Add Heiser's books to the canon of the Bible and canonize them? All right. Why should I take his opinion over against the early Christians who unanimously taught Genesis 1 26, Genesis 3 22, Genesis 11 7, Isaiah 6 8? It's the Trinity, Father speaking to the Son and the Spirit, not to the Heavenly Council. Okay. That's your, your attitude. Your allegiance is to the Trinity, to the Scriptures, provided they're interpreted correctly, and to the Church of Jesus Christ that he has preserved for 2,000 years. And even among the writers and the fathers, the Catholic Orthodox acknowledge, we don't go simply by the opinion of an isolated Christian writer here or there, because he can be mistaken. But when we have the church unanimously teaching X, or in council coming to an agreement, or a majority, then we decide with the majority, or the unanimity, because you're going to have to have strong evidence to go with the minority view. Right? Let's finish it now. Okay, let's finish it. Here you go. If the estimates of modern-day scientists as to the age of the physical universe are anywhere near correct, Jesus' existence as a spirit creature, note the blasphemy, they're Arians, but notice their admission, though, began thousands of of millions of years prior to the creation of the first human. This firstborn spirit son was used by his father in the creation of all other things. Notice other lightest. John 1, 3, Colossians 1, 16, 1, 17. This would include the million, millions of other spirit sons of Jehovah God's heavenly family. So Jesus was responsible to creating every other created thing and all the angels, okay, as well as the physical universe and the creatures originally produced within it logically, see, it's saying, dude, common sense. If that's what we believe, Heiser, that's what we believe, Daniel Wallace, then it makes sense. It was to this firstborn son that Jehovah said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Man, just common sense, dude. All these other created things were not only created through him, meaning Jesus, but also for him as God's firstborn there of all things. Doubtless. On many occasions during his preeminent existence as a word, notice, doubtless, don't doubt this, that before he became flesh from the virgin, Jesus was already acting as Joe's spokesman to persons on earth. So they're admitting to you he appeared in the Old Testament. While certain texts refer to Jehovah as though directly speaking to humans, other texts make clear that he did so through an angelic representative. And compare these passages, Exodus 3, 2 to 4, Exodus 3. 7, 30, 35, Genesis 16, 7, 11, 13, 22, 1, 11, 12, 15, 18. Reasonably, in the majority of such cases, get ready. They even admit that the one who appeared in the garden was Jesus in his pre existence. Reasonably, the majority of such cases, God spoke through the word. He likely did so in Eden. 
For on two of the three occasions where mention is made of God speaking there, the record specifically shows someone with him, undoubtedly his son. Damn. What the hell is going on? Here's the article again. I want to add this to the description box. Here it is, Romeo. Because this one I didn't add yet. Are you mind blown? The Jehovah's Witness has written you that in Genesis 1, 26, 30, the father speaking to the son. In 2, 16, the father speaking to the son. 2, 6, 17. In Genesis 3, 18, 19, 22, the father is speaking to the son. And who is the angel that guided Israel? The angel who guided Israel through the wilderness and whose voice the Israelites were strictly to obey because Jehovah's name was within him may therefore have been God's son the word. Damn. What? And what does Greg Stafford say? My favorite Aryan apologist. May he come to the fullness of the truth. Greg Stafford. In the first edition of his book, Joe's Witnesses Defended, an answer to scholars and critics. Page 165. Look what he says. God was addressing the word when he said, let us make man in our image. Wow. So now notice what I say here. It is rather unfortunate that these individuals and groups fail to realize how their admission that the use of plural pronouns in the aforementioned text shows that God was speaking to his son, the Lord Jesus, in his pre-human existence, refutes their belief that Christ is a creation of Jehovah. It is sad that they do not see or do not want to see that this actually proves that Jesus is an eternal pers person of Jehovah. Example given, the Son who, in union with the Father and the Holy Spirit, is none other than the Jehovah God Almighty that later became a flesh and blood human being. You caught it? First last, good to have you, man. It's been like 50 years we haven't seen you. But compare this to now this. What? Let me now break your hearts. Compare this to this. Ready? Let me break your hearts. Let me show you something. All right. One second. All righty then. All right, one second. Let me do this real quick. Bruce Lee's Bruce Lee. Brandon Lee's Brandon Lee. Bruce Lee's Bruce Lee. Brandon Lee's Brandon Lee. All right. I want to see something here. Let me see if they have notes here. Yep. Here we go. Guys, Catholics, let me break your hearts. New American Bible, revised edition. New American Bible, revised edition. First and last, dude. We haven't seen you in ages, bro. You're locked up in Canada, eh? Hope you're doing good. New American Bible, revised edition. Guys, this is a Catholic Bible. Look at their note. You see the note? We're going to go we'll finish it here. In part five, we're going to go into more evidence. Okay. You guys ready? American, New American Bible, revised edition, a Catholic Bible. Let us make, here's our note. In the ancient Near Ears and sometimes in the Bible, God was imagined was imagined as presiding over an assembly of heavenly beings who deliberated and decided upon matters on earth. 1 Kings 22, 19 and 22, Isaiah 6, 8, Psalm 29, verse 1 and 2, Psalm 82, Psalm 89, 6 to 7, Job 1, 6, 2, 1, 8, 3, 8, 7. This scene accounts for the plural form here and in Genesis 11, 7. Did you catch it? They're telling you God is talking to the heavenly council. Israel's God was always considered most high over the heavenly beings. Did you catch it? You caught it? A Catholic Bible with Catholic notes saying, God is speaking to heavenly council. So it's not just evangelical Trinitarians. Let's see what it says in 322. No note here. But you caught it? Do you caught it, guys? When you have Christians who say they're Trinitarian producing such notes, do you wonder then why? Our enemies, Muslims and Jews and anti-Trinitarians, have a hard time believing us when we say this is the Trinity? You caught it? This is the New American Bible Revised Edition. When enemies like this, you don't need friends because they pretend to be our friends. 
with friends like these, you don't need enemies because they're destroying the ancient tradition from within the church. How can Catholics or evangelicals say it's referring to the Emily Council when we're supposed to be in continuity with the ancient church? And I just showed you from the writings of the ancient church, the writings of the ancient church, that they all said this is the Trinity. And even Joel's Witnesses admit it. Here you go. Here's the article again. Let me show it to you. Let's do it here. Okay. Let me get the article. Right here. Let me show you. One second. Let me get that article up and running. Here you go. And then we'll put in the description. We're, we're done. Oh, where is it, man? Trinity, pronouns, plural pronouns. See, sometimes I even forget the names of my own articles. All right, please, Lord, let me find it. Because I got to put it. Early church's interpretation of the Hebrew Bible's use of plural pronouns. There you go. That's it. We're done. Okay, Lord willing, in part five, we'll give you more evidence. Pray the numbers increase for the glory of the Father, Son, and Spirit, not for my praise. Guys, please pray for us in the front lines. You prayer warriors, ask God to energize and empower me. Strict discipline. More strict spiritual discipline and physical discipline. Eat tighter and healthier so I don't ever become overweight and that obesity will be used to snare me. More intense physical training. Tight on my eating, but more intense spiritual disciplines. Praying more, fasting more, getting to the Eucharist more, studying the Bible more. My daughter's in love with Jesus, and the Lord allows me to see them, and it brings them to me, and they grow up before my eyes. And the Lord removed them from this wicked, adulterous union. And that I'm patient on the Lord, and the Lord provide financially that I finish the race with integrity and die glorifying the Lord with my daughters and I in love with the Lord and keep pure until marriage. Now, Lord willing, I'll see you tomorrow. We're going to do part five, a lot more meat. I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you... We're blessed and encouraged. The links to the articles will be in the description box. Take the sessions. Take the articles. Take the information. Learn them accurately. Share them accurately. You can upload them, translate them, clip them. Yours free of charge. May the Lord provide for us and through us. We love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. Heal us and deliver us and purify us to love you, even unto death, until you return. And bring my daughters to me in the almighty name of Jesus. You'll be glorified. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Maranatha. Christ is risen, risen indeed. Take care.